It's like, okay, you, you know, this is certainly not a John 316 movie. <laughs> but but it is it is one that's going to help people to ask questions. And that's, again, a point. And so it's kind of a, a tale of, you know, someone figuring out they've got an issue in life, they've got to deal with it in, in order to uh, rescue themselves. Oh, hey, Timothy Radichak here from Against the Tide Media. Uh, this is a special episode of Chatting with the Chosen because we're not going to be chatting with anyone from the Chosen. But we will be talking about some things that are near and dear to all of your hearts. Today, we are going to be talking about an upcoming film. It's in post-production now. You may have heard some static about it already. It's called Warehouse, One Step Away from a bad forever. And it's my pleasure to have here on the show uh, the writer and director, uh, J. Darren Wales, and the producer, uh, Stuart Lachlan Bennett. Um, I don't have three names, um, but I remember when Francis Ford Coppola once said, never trust any man with three names. And he would know because he had three names. So, uh, I was also told never trust anyone who has stocks in hairspray. <laughs> no. I obviously don't have any of those. So. <laughs> so in the interest of full disclosure, I, I just want to tell everyone watching, I have not seen this film because it's in post-production, which means it's not ready to be viewed yet. I have also not read the script. All I know about this particular film is what I have read on the IMDb and also what I have seen on YouTube on Stewart's YouTube channel, which is called Lachlan Films. You'll want to look at that, click the subscribe button and then ring the bell and you'll get to see a lot of behind the scenes footage. So for the people who have never heard of this warehouse film. Can somebody start off without giving away this, the uh, the plot points? Exactly what this film is about. Okay, well, it's about a twenty five year old guy who's a kind of a never do well. He's a film graduate from film school, and he was working in the film industry before the story starts. But then, the, all the business in the area dries up for where he lives, so he moves back in with his parents. And that's kind of where we pick up the story six months after he's moved back in, staying up late at night, playing video games with his best friend who still lives across the house from him in his parents' house. But he has a job, whereas our, our main character doesn't have a job. And so the parents of our main character, whose name's Artie, his dad is an ex-Marine from uh, Vietnam era. And so he's a war hero, uh, POW gung ho Marines, a whole nine yards. And so his dad's fed up with it, that he's living downstairs in the basement and not doing anything. So his dad threatens to kick him out of the house if he doesn't have a job by New Year's. And so sure enough, here comes New Year's and he doesn't have a job. So his dad's over it. So he calls this a uh, random ad in the newspaper for a warehouse job and gets his son a job interview for that day, New Year's Eve. And so he goes you know, and tells his son, you've got to interview for this job for a long, so long story short, he goes and interviews and gets the job and he has to start that night on New Year's Eve. And so he works there and then he finds out everybody's there because they have some type of issue in their life that they're trying to deal with, but they don't really necessarily realize what the issue is or if they even have an issue, but they can't leave the warehouse until they figure out their issue if they ever figure it out. They don't ever figure it out. They're stuck there. And so unbeknownst to him, he's got an issue too. He doesn't realize that's why he's there. And he runs into a little two-year-old girl that's that's staying there who accidentally got it because of her babysitter. And so, but that, that she ends up becoming a pivotal character in getting him out in time or trying to get him out in time uh, before he can't leave. And so it's kind of a tale of, you know, someone figuring out they've got an issue in life, they've got to deal with it in, in order to uh, rescue themselves. Stuart, anything to add? Yeah, well, it, it's a story of second chances where, you know, uh, sometimes we were aware of things in our lives and sometimes things maybe are so habitual we don't even realize. And yet, so, you know, this guy is uh, shaping up to be a loser. And so he has a chance and you, you might say it's a God kind of chance 
where uh, he's given a chance to try to change things in his life and really step up to the plate. Now, again, in the interest of full disclosure for the audience, who people don't, don't already know, I was born and raised in the Roman Catholic Church. And what you, what Darren was describing kind of sounded to me like purgatory. And we know that's a controversial topic. Listen, I'm a Roman Catholic. I don't know that I buy into the whole purgatory thing. Is it unfair for me to draw that conclusion? Or is that sort of what you were aiming at to, to start the discussion? No, I don't think that's unfair. It, it's kind of what I was aiming at. I didn't really want to call it purgatory for the main reason, just not sounding cliche. But that's kind of what it's kind of a holding area until they figure out what's going on with them. So what's Dax's issue? Pride. Narcissism. All? Negativity. Yeah. If they ever figure out what's going on with them, they, they maybe have a chance to get out. But if they don't, then they, they're stuck there or they may end up somewhere else they don't want to be. So it's kind of a little bit of play on purgatory. It, it, theologically, it's probably not 100% sound, but then it's the movies. And so we're taking creative license with stuff. But uh, this, the, the main idea of it is, like Stuart said, a, it's a story of second chances. So It's a horror fantasy genre, too. So, so I mean, you got to take some creative license. It's like, okay, you, you know, this is certainly not a John 316 movie. <laughs> but but it is it is one that's going to help people to ask questions, and that's again a point. I, I I was just getting ready to ask you what genre you would you would put the film in. Darren, would you agree with where Stewart put the movie? Yeah, I, it, when you say horror, I, I mean it's not your classic horror with blood and guts. It's not that at all. It's more of a horror slash thriller type thing where there's some scary moments, but it's not like. Anything where a kid couldn't sit there and watch and not be, they're not going to yeah. be terrorized by it, I don't believe. So it's very calm in that sense. But it's more kind of a thriller-ish type of, of horror, I guess, if you don't tag it horror at all. It's not that you're a classic horror yeah. at all. Yeah, I, I guess if you're a fan of Stranger Things, you could watch this, no problem. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess what you're suggesting is that people's heads don't come off and they don't get <laughs> right. It's more of a, uh, an Alfred Hitchcock you know, cerebral type. Yeah, somewhat. I mean, there are some th things where, I guess, semi-scary things happen, but it's not like, again, there's no blood or anything like that anywhere. So uh, I, I, a very short story. So I had one uh, student who worked on the film and she said to me, oh, if it's horror, I, I can't be anywhere near the set. I can't stand beside it. But it's like, <laughs> okay, uh, I think you need to read the script and it's like, once you've looked at the end and yeah, so it's just nothing like that. <laughs> well, not that I want to turn. I learned. Oh, go ahead. I was just going, oh, hi, I'm Noah Bennett, founder of Against Type Media. No one knows who um, you are. You only run the, the, the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I was just going to say that I recently learned about, there, there's basically two different kinds of horror. One, like you were saying, blood and guts which is completely not what this film is. And there, and then there are these films about overcoming these problems of the supernatural. And it's more of a thriller and a struggle. But um, this film definitely does have a message of light. And we'll point, like you said, we'll point people to asking questions. I think people who have read C.S. Lewis or maybe This Present Darkness, those kinds of things, films that deal with the supernatural, and that's where this fits into that kind of genre. So it's, it's kind of different. And so it's a little hard to peg, actually. Yeah. Now, like some for their minds to just kind of play with, something for them to think about. For a minute, a little bit of a mind struggle, and I really like films like that. That's why I'm 100% on board with this project, and very excited to see it. Now, again, I don't, I don't want to turn this into a theological debate, but I know my Catholicism well enough to know that once you're in purgatory, eventually you get out. Now, I don't know the plot of. The warehouse, as the subtitle suggests, one step away from bad forever. Are there people who are going to be stuck there forever, or do you not want to disclose that? 
Yes and no. <laughs> that doesn't really answer it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, I once had a Jesuit tell me that if the people in purgatory are in torment, but they're happy because they know that at some point their torment is going to end and they'll get out of there. But it sounds to me like the warehouse is a little more complicated than that. Yeah. And, and for the sake of the viewers, it may be best to leave it that way. Yeah, let's, let's just say there's no guarantees. Okay, fair enough. Now, <laughs> is it is it fair to say that the two of you have a good deal of experience with the so-called uh, Christian cinema? I know, Stuart, you have, Darren. Um, for myself, not not so much. I, I, know, I, grew up I notice you do a lot of FBI and, and uh, yeah. police stuff, which is good. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I started out doing uh, training videos for OSHA-type programs and then i moved into doing stuff for discovery channel and doing uh, crime docudrama stuff and then uh this recently in the past 10 years i started working more in the area of christian uh, type film making to that extent a little bit not a whole lot Stuart, uh, people i guess have more familiarity with uh, some of the documentaries that you've done on a biblical level when they see warehouse are they going to go Oh my goodness, this guy's off his head. Well, he's falling off his rocker. What are you <laughs> expecting that? Or um, yeah, ho hopefully, hopefully not, because yeah, I mean, I, I do uh, you know, um, I like uh, to make documentaries about the early church because I think some circles of the church we've largely forgotten some of the roots. So I'm currently, you know, working on a documentary about the life of St. Barnabas and his influence on the early church. I did a film about St. Nicholas, which is currently broadcasting all over the world in the Russian language. But I've done a, a few features, worked on two, um, some of them very evangelistic. Um, things in different countries, in different languages. I think one of the things that this film does is tries to bring something new to what we may have labeled as faith-based films. And I, I unfortunately, I think the idea of faith-based films has become very narrow in terms of what directors and producers are making, just as I personally see Christian music as being really quite narrow in the mainstream. And it's like, I think some of us cry for something fresh and new, which is why when we saw Lord of the Rings or things like that, you know, uh, made into film, it's like, oh, great, somebody's finally, you know, making that in, and you know, Tolkien's background and so on. And so we're looking for... Uh, new types. And I applaud Darren for writing a script that really takes up that challenge to try to introduce something new um, and different. And it's not just for a Christian audience, it's for a broader audience. Yeah. Now, Darren, I want to interview you as as a, a writer now, not as a director. I know a lot of that, that's not glamorous, but it's very interesting to me. I know <laughs> so that I've had a lot of personal experiences where I've had jobs where I felt like I was in purgatory. Exactly what triggered this idea? Was there a specific event in your life, or was this just a, a theme that you were interested in exploring? Well, originally when I was trying to come up with an idea, I was trying to think, okay, where can I shoot? Where can I build a story that's going to be kind of like one location? I don't want that to drive the whole story, but it saves a lot of money when you're in production if you can not move around a whole lot. And so that kind of was where it started out. I said, well, if we have somebody who doesn't have a whole lot of gumption to go out and do something, kind of wants it to come to him, which I see a lot sometimes, uh, you know, I, I, I teach school. And so I see sometimes students that they graduate and they they like, well, no one will hire me. So, well, go out and get a job. They're not going to come knocking on your door. And then they, they, some kids just don't quite catch on to that. Like, You've got to go too. So this is a guy who's expecting them to come find him. I thought, what if he works in a warehouse? Because when I was in high school, my summers, I worked in a warehouse. And we, I moved boxes around and I you know, moved people and unpacked people. I thought, what's well, a pretty stable place? Not a whole lot goes on in there except when you're loading and unloading. And so it may be a good place to shoot. It'd be kind of interesting. You know, I, I'm not sure what kind of warehouse we could get, but we'll see what we can find. And thought, see if we can come up with a story there where somebody's kind of stuck somewhere and they don't really realize why they're stuck, which we've all kind of, like Stuart said, we have stuff going on in our lives, lives sometimes. We don't really realize that we've dug ourselves into a hole sometimes until 
something comes along and shows us or something tells us or whatever happens. And so this is kind of this guy. That's what he's going through. He's kind of stuck in a hole. He doesn't realize he doesn't realize he's in a place that's not really real in the on our plane. You know, that's, he's in this place that appears every once in a while and he gets sucked into it. And if he can get out, great. If he can't, well, he's kind of stuck. So uh, that was kind of where I was going with it. Part of it, you know, to speak to our students a little bit or any student in general, like, you know, you've got to go and do this. People aren't going to come call you to come direct the next great American film or whatever job you're after. You're going to have to go out there and work, <laughs> actually. So that's kind of where it came from. So question for the both of you. Let's let's take Warehouse out of the specific genre of horror fantasy, and let's just put it into the indie category, which is very broad. Mm-hmm. Um, I know from firsthand experience that indie filmmaking is not easy. It's not for the weak of heart. <laughs> it's it's not not for the squeamish. Um, but both of you have a background in the indie filmmaking, and I I know now with with streaming and people aren't going to the theaters as much, and so they're they're viewing content at home on the web. Is this a particularly exciting time to be in indie? Or is it just as difficult as it always was? Well, I think from a director's viewpoint, it's there's w- way more opportunities, but that's opened the floodgates to more competition. So in my mind, it's just as, as difficult. There's just more opportunities to, to fail or to succeed. So it's it's just it's to me it's it's just as difficult as it ever was. It's just easier to get your content out there, maybe if you get somebody to pick it up, but uh, to me, it's just as hard to break in. So from a writer's standpoint, it's actually maybe a little harder because there's a lot more people sitting at home doing nothing with COVID going on, it seems. And so a lot more people are writing stuff. They've been putting things off because they're working all the time. So there's a lot more people writing scripts, at least right now. Anyway, I've, I've noticed in, in screenwriting contests, there's a lot more people writing. So in that area, it's a little bit more difficult, but the good stuff rises to the top anyway. So The indie market, it, it's kind of leveled things for opportunity. But as Darren says, you know, uh, quality things are going to rise to the top. And so we strive for quality. I think we're both perfectionists. We're both seasoned professionals. You know, I worked in this industry uh, personally for more than 40 years. So a good script, finding good cast, but really good crew. And that was one of the things of the crew on this. We had, you know, many uh, professionals that we worked with coming back into key positions to work on the film to guarantee quality. Alongside that, one of the things as a producer I need to say is that this was an educational opportunity because one of the goals in making this film was to help to develop the Christian filmmakers of the future. So we had a lot of students also working in roles on this film giving them the opportunity to work on a really great feature film. Hopefully that will speak to people in terms of um, where our hearts are and what we're trying to do as well as turn out a great film. Uh, and I mentioned... And Darren, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Darren, I just wanted to mention um, from what you were saying earlier about not a whole lot goes on in the warehouse, on a warehouse, just from personal experience with me and you and Stuart, you're so right. I need to know. I mean, yeah. we were actually working, filming at a warehouse for the warehouse, and it was a great opportunity to share with the casting crew a little of my past life, what I did before against the type, showing the dog videos I made. <laughs> you, I mentioned this earlier, and I, I want to bring it up now. Um, is, Raina Osbey, who is well known to the the viewers of The Chosen, she plays a character in Warehouse called Boo. And I, I don't know much about her character because, again, not seen the film, not read the script. But I'm curious to know how the connection was made w- with Raina. I don't guess you had to audition her because you saw how fabulous she was in The Chosen. Or did you have to audition her? Well, we came upon Raina through uh, Noah and his sister because they had worked with her or met her. I'm not sure totally how you did that through The Chosen. So 
they had known her through that. I had not actually seen The Chosen yet at the time. And so I was unaware of her. And so they told me, why don't you have her audition? I was like, sure, I'll audition anybody. And of course, it was, we had to do it through video. She's in Florida. We sent her uh, some sides and she did audition. And I was like, wow, that's pretty good. I said, I'll never get her. She's in Florida. <laughs> so I didn't, even, I, at first I didn't, it's not that I didn't consider it. Like I'd love to have her, but I, I don't, I didn't hold my breath, you know? And so, but then one thing led to another and she, I had her audition again and do some different parts. Like, you know, she's really good. If we could get her, that would be great. Cause that would, you know, one thing that, you know, they always say in, in show business, don't work with animals and kids. And so I was like, but I wrote one into the script, so it's my fault. So I thought, you know, she would be one of that would save me a lot of headaches, probably if I could get her, because I don't think I'd have to do a whole lot of directing with her. She seems to be just fine on her own, and so uh, which turned out to be true. And so, yeah, that's how we ended up getting her. I don't know if you want to add anything to that or not, Stuart. But that's that's kind of how that came about. She uh, she was just a joy to work with. I mean, her and her mom. I mean, my goodness, both professionals and just. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, she came, she knew her whole lines, she took direction well, and oh my gosh, I mean, I can't wait for people to see the, the final thing. She's yeah. really great. Let me add one thing from what I understand, this is, one, this is the first big thing she had ever acted in. I don't know about that. And it's like, yeah, I, I couldn't, you, if you hadn't told me that, I wouldn't have known. She was awesome. Speech, yeah, yeah she cool. listened to me, which is not always true with some people. She listened to me. She tried to do everything I asked her to do. I tried not to talk her head off so it would be simple. And I could have talked her head off and she still would have done fine, I think. So she was just phenomenal. I, I loved working with her. She was a sweetheart. She, you know, anything I asked her to do, she would do it. And so, again, working with her mom, she was right there. Her mom is a mama bear, but she wasn't a stage mom. She was she mm. was there for support and she was wonderful. And you know, so they were, I, I hated to see them leave. I w wish they could have stayed for the whole shoot. It was just lovely to have them on, on set. So in other words, Stuart, she was worth the million dollar paycheck you wrote her. <laughs> she was, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. She, that young lady is going to go far in this industry. Yeah. Um, well, the two of you basically summed it up. As for the story of how she connected with Against the Tide, that's a story for another time. It's a conversation for another time. <laughs> so, guys, before before we get out of this, can can you kind of give us a timeline? Now, I get the sense that the film is finished shooting. It is in post production, unless I'm wrong, and obviously it, it will not come out before 2022. But what 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 timeline are you guys looking at right now? Well, our goal is to get it done by the an out. Well, at least finished for like a premiere or something of that sort. Uh, end of April, beginning of May. But that's what we're hoping for. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. But that's our goal. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so um, late uh, spring, the early summer. Wrapped, though, right? The film has wrapped. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, the the picture cut is done, and so yeah, we're now in audio post and just about to get the music score started. So, uh, but I would be remiss as producer to say that, you know, uh, this is an independent film and we had enough money to actually do the production. We still don't quite have enough funds to finish the post-production. So I right here, I make an appeal to people to look at the website and I think you'll be able to put a link with this. We have a fundraising page. We need to, to raise just a few thousand more dollars, but uh, it's not a whole lot to uh, to finish this up. So we, we do need a little bit of help if uh, you guys could help us with that, but also pray for this project, pray for it to be used, you know, to to help people one step further to God, you know, and it's like to ask the right questions. I think that's one of the places of a film like this, for a film like this, yeah. Well, yeah. it's the You're life of right. an indie filmmaker that you never have enough money but in all fairness, Stuart, you really should pay Darren something for what he's doing. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't, pay, don't pay him as a writer. Pay him as a director. Nobody. Yes, neither, 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 us, uh, neither of us are getting paid a dime for this film, believe me. <laughs> and you're completely right, Stuart. I mean, a few more thousand dollars isn't a whole lot considering, like, some other achievements like the chosen. I mean, they just finished funding season three. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so and and un- un- unfortunately, these films don't get made without money. So, um, and really, yeah, most, of the, cuts, yeah, most, <laughs> like, yeah. Know, most of this money really is going to the professionals who worked on it, who we had to bring in, and the actors and so on. But uh, as I said, those of us in the in the more key roles, are, you know, we're not doing this for ourselves. You know, we're doing it to uh, to give opportunities, particularly to. Uh, folks like the students I mentioned earlier. Well, I think we've entered an era of technology now where everybody who has an iPhone thinks they can make a movie. Yeah. And that's kind of true, actually. Huh? <laughs> I only want to ask um, a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll put this uh, to bed. Obviously, indie filmmakers and students in particular need to learn the lesson that if you think a movie is going to cost a million dollars, you'd better raise $2 million because another million dollars is going to be for promotion. You got to get the word out there because no one's ever going to come to see a movie that they don't know anything about. Fortunately, now we have social media and they would never ban anyone from saying anything controversial. So you guys don't have to worry about that. But I'm I'm being extremely cynical here. Um, what is your marketing plan? Is it are you hoping that you'll get a big enough distributor that that headache will be solved for you? I noticed that you're doing a lot on social media now. Uh, is that going to be the key that you're going to reach out to to people through Twitter and and Facebook and Instagram? Going to start with that now? No, it's all yours. Okay. All right. <laughs> So, yeah, so, um, so uh, other films that we've been involved with uh, have been picked up by people like Sony and so on. And so, you know, we're going to be taking it to consultation with uh, some of our connections to, uh, to different distributors. And so we're very hopeful that it'll get picked up. Um, but also, yeah, continuing social media, getting the word out to everywhere we can and by any means possible. Yes. So one of the difficulties about uh, independent films where you really have to do that. And so, yes, we're all of the above. <laughs> by, any, by any means necessary. So it's, tell us, uh, give us the link or talk about the, the place where the viewers can go if they want to financially support the film. I've already mentioned your YouTube channel where they can go and look at what's going on behind the scenes. But give us some information how people can connect with you. Well, uh, we have a Give Lively page, um, but that that's linked through my nonprofit website. And so fundraising right now is, is coming through that nonprofit, which is Lachlan Creative Group. So if you go to that page, you will see uh, the link there where they can support the film. And you will see a few promotional things there too. And also the Lachlan Creative Group um, Facebook page too. So those are two places. But I'm sure with uh, this interview too, uh, I would imagine there's going to be a link uh, directly with the interview too um, when it's... uh, when it's put on social media packages. Oh, and Stuart, here's a tip. Um, There is no better way to get our fans to go to that website than to sing the name of the website with a Dallas Jenkins style, with a Dallas Jenkins style jingle. Oh, God. All right. All all I can do is say happy. (laughs) So let me let me do that because you're going to edit this anyway, Noah, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, he is. So, so if people would like to support this film, it's very easy uh, because they can go to a nonprofit website, and so the nonprofit website is Lachlan Creative Group, and it is because of my roots, which are from Scotland. So it's Lachlan. If you can say Lachlan, you can get to the website and you can donate on the little donate button. I'm not going to sing like Dallas Jenkins, but I'm going to do it with all the fervor 
you can possibly imagine. It's Lachlan Creative Group. And so if you go there, you will be able to find the warehouse. And we would really appreciate your financial support and your prayers. Thank you. Let me let me wipe off the spit from my... <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, Stuart, somewhere Robbie Burns is smiling. <laughs> you're only a great son of Scotland. No. And just just one last question and then... Oh, we'll by the way, I'm wearing my black watch. Tom. You are. Oh, yes. Good man. I am. <laughs> um, and I'm a big fan of John Brown, who was oh. the... The, the assistant to Queen Victoria. Yes. They, they, they were just friends now, remember? There was oh, just friends. Um, yes. Nothing going on there. Yes. Nothing yes. going on. Um, this journey is not over yet because the film isn't finished yet. But Darren, if you had it to do over again, would you do it? Oh, yeah. It was a lot of fun. I would do it. It was fun. There were times when it wasn't fun, but most the most part, it was fun. Hanging up the first phone call. So, yeah, amen I mean, to that. Yeah, what he said. All right. No, no regrets. Listen, folks, I and I promise you guys, I will make a donation on your fundraising page. And he's been I, sitting out for a few months now. Well, now I'm actually <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a writer, Noah. I don't make any money. OK, so I, I will make. Yeah, I believe you. I, just, I ask you and I ask you to do the same thing. I can't wait to see this movie. You guys can't wait to see this movie. So. Thank you both so much for uh, agreeing to talk to someone incredibly eccentric, but you, you've both been very interesting. Um, God bless you guys. Thank you, Noah, for putting this together. Thank you, Tim. I know it was kind of uh, last minute, which... No, I'm, I'm, not gonna, right I'm not going to name any names, but Noah Glenn Bennett is, you know, notorious for doing this. But you know what? That's the movie biz. You know, you know what I mean? Sometimes you have to wait for sundown to get that perfect shot. No, you don't oh. anymore because now you do it in CGI. But <laughs> nevertheless, guys, th thank you very much. I, this was this was a pleasure, and we're out. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Hey everyone, it's Noah Bennett, founder of Against the Tide Media. I just found out about a new project called The Warehouse. I believe this film has the power to impact lives in the same ways as The Chosen, The Shift. And not only that, but the message of the story can reach a really wide audience and help pique their curiosity, eventually leading them towards the ultimate source of love. This is a film that I believe in and a film that I would love to see you join me in supporting. And how you can do that, please visit the link in the description. Or text WAREHOUSE to 44321. Your donation is 100% tax deductible and each donor will receive a thank you in the credits. Keep watching Against the Type Media for interviews and other content about The Chosen, The Warehouse, The Shift, and so many more projects. And remember to hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell. Thank you again. Hello. I'm here. Everyone knows that, right? Because in the state of Maryland, right. I can't <laughs> do it unless you give me your permission. <laughs> and uh, just to let you know, I'm not gonna be here throughout the whole thing uh just making sure everything goes okay um, okay you can leave now no. yeah i can leave now all right i'm gonna count myself in and then we'll start oh hey timothy radicek here <laughs> Showing the dog videos I made. <laughs> you, you know what? Um, I'm getting a message here that says, uh, well, I have seven minutes left in this meeting. 
is that going to cut us off or do we ha- can we start over again if if that should happen sometimes i've found that to be a lie yeah no so have i but i've never gotten the the ticking clock i i feel like um yeah, I- you know, a car is going to explode somewhere here <laughs> but um Okay, I I mentioned this earlier, and I want to bring it up now. A few moments later. Okay, so I'm going to do a Pee Wee Herman, and I'm going to say, I meant for that to happen. Um, (laughs) Sorry about the interruption, folks. You know, the jacket set like it was today. Yeah, wherever you put it when you take it off. Or no, but not, 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 well, not right now. I'm okay if you get a little bit. But... Talent on set. And we're out. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And so. folks, I will just note, and I can put this in the outtakes, that I was not originally planned to be in this interview. I just was just randomly happened to... Um, I didn't have time to leave. I wasn't given time to leave, so. <laughs> Excuse me while I say, uh, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so. All right, we can, put a black, we can put a black square there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, and everything will be right, yes. Brilliant. Guys, Brilliant. guys right. best, best of luck. I, I Believe me, I, 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 I don't want to sound pompous and say that, that we're colleagues, but I know what you're going through and i I don't envy you the the thing about writing is that once it's done the writer is out of it that was not your privilege (laughs) darren (laughs) but uh, so uh, darren darren i don't know so tim was telling me earlier he worked for pure flicks for 15 years yeah and i'm I'm still alive i mean (laughs) (laughs) yeah you know, it it was persistence. I'm glad I, I they made some really, really good movies, i.e. the ones I wrote, and they made some that weren't so good. But nevertheless, overall, it was impressive enough that Sony agreed to buy the whole barnyard. So yeah. good on them. Uh, we have a lot of things in development. Sony is being very, very generous right now. Oh, and if you think that working for PureFlix for 15 years is something, I've been catching lizards in my backyard for 13 years. You know, I think I would have rather caught the lizards, but don't, don't, don't go by me. <laughs> All right, guys, it's All great. Right. I'm, I'm in Baltimore, and I can hear the gunshots. No, I can't. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what? I forgot to ask you guys. What part of the world? You're in Virginia? Right. We're in Virginia. Yeah. No, like, they're, they're, actually, actually, they're actually right down the street from me. No, no. And, yeah. and and that's where the film was shot, right? You found a warehouse and yeah, several. Okay. Yes. Now, yeah, was, was this a working warehouse? I mean, were they using it or had it been abandoned? Two oh, no, different warehouses, ones. actually. Well, two warehouses and then a, a third one for the elevator scenes. Yeah. We, these warehouses we were working in didn't have an elevator. There was and, and there was before. a there was a train that went through one of them. You remember yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah well, so it was fun but it it all worked out we shot a lot at night when people weren't in there so yeah which was well, perfect when this film is finished and i get a chance to see it i'm probably only going to have a million questions to ask you guys sure and i hope you'll be patient enough because some of my questions will be very esoteric but <laughs> okay <laughs> but hey thanks guys so much i really appreciate it Tim, it was great to meet you appreciate it thanks Thank for your time you. Thank you, everyone. All right. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.